described in captioned media program. In the classroom and online, dcmp.org. A steamboat slowly cruises a broad river. Dark smoke belches from its tall smokestack. Full trees line each bank. Titles, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Directed by Herbert Swope, Jr. Produced by Martin Manulis. The immortal story of Huck Finn is bound up with the legends that are a part of that greatest of all American rivers, Mississippi. In a cave with craggy, pockmarked walls. And these particular adventures of Huck began on a certain summer afternoon in one of the hidden limestone caves bordering the Mississippi. Here, in quest of a stolen treasure chest of gold, have come Huck and his friend Tom Sawyer. The two teenage boys shovel earth in the cave, lit by a torch mounted behind them. They both wear brimmed hats and jeans or overalls with suspenders over loose shirts. They scoop coins in their hands. On a ledge across a fissure or deep opening, a figure crouches and looks toward the boys. He's long-haired and wears a braid with a single feather atop his head. The man leaps across the fissure and lands near the boys, only to stumble and fall backward. The teens gaze toward the spot where the man teetered backward and creeped toward the area, bending down on hands and knees to peer into the abyss. It's Engine Joe. Must have stole the gold from the robbers and hid it here. He's sure done for now. See, that river down there is so deep it goes most to China. They'll never bother us no more. The barefoot, blonde, and freckled Huck in a straw hat and the left side of his overalls unhooked steps back to the buried treasure. Thank Tom. This is all ours. Oh, we can divide it up like they said whoever found it could. Yeah, no more spool. Just lying along the riverbank and fishing the whole day. That's the life for us. You don't even have your own mean plot to worry about no more. Since you want you got yourself grounded. Do you realize that for the first time in our lives, we're free, being all on our own? They stuff their pockets with coins. Hey, I got an idea, huh? Why don't you and me become blood brothers? How do you do that? I'll show you. Tom stands and pulls out a pocket knife. In the storybook by a Frenchman named Dumont. There were these two friends, Solomon Sacred Oath. Whenever one of them got into trouble with pirates or deadly villains, it was the other one, his true blood brother. Showing up to rescue him safe and sound. Tom pricks his left index finger with the knife. It grimaces. There. Now you make a little cut too, Huck. And one of your fingers. Huck does so. Yeah, that only draws the blood. Well, that's the idea. That's how we get to be blood brothers. They press their nicked fingers together and Tom raises his right hand. I, Tom Sawyer, take this solemn and sacred oath that Huck Finn is my true friend and blood brother for life. I'll come to his aid whenever he's in dire distress. No matter what the cost to me, I so swear. I so swear, ditto. This is our secret, Tom. Stack of Bibles ten feet high. It's our secret. They examine their fingers, shake their hands, then recline nearby, pulling corn cob pipes from their pockets. Ain't this a life, though? Ain't it, Joe? They toss stones in their hands. go exactly as the boys had planned. Huck Finn, because he was underage and an orphan, found himself bound over by court to the widow Douglas as her adopted son. The paddle wheel of a steamboat spins. And here, one early evening a month later, widow Douglas is entertaining Tom's Aunt Polly and her young house guest, Miss Mary Jane Wilts from Morganville, just down the river a piece. A two-story frame house. A light-haired Mary Jane is at the piano with Aunt Polly in a shawl and gray dress and the widow Douglas in black with a white collar seated not far away. Oh, my great lander goes to Mary Jane. That 
sure is elegant and ladylike playing. Oh, thank you, Miss Farley. The widow goes to a window. I do declare I don't know where those boys can be. They promised faithfully not to get themselves dirty and to be here promptly on the hour so as none of us would be late to prayer meetings. Oh, you know how boys are. No, I don't, but I'm learning. Huckleberry can be a trial. I must say you've turned him into a regular little gentleman. I'm that anxious to have Mary Jane meet with him. And Judge Thatcher, isn't the judge going to accompany us tonight? Oh, yes, he'll be here directly. He sent word he's been detained. On the matter of investing the $6,000 fortune, how can Tom have a peek? Ah, the judge is a wise man. Think of knowing how to invest that money so that each one of the boys will get a whole dollar interest every day. All the days. Yes, indeed. And with a fortune like that, the boys will be required to be gentlemen. The boys on a staircase. Boys? Huck? Tom? Is that you? Drat these store boys shoes. They squeak. Mine, too. We should have taken them off. Oh, what's the matter with you, boys? Cat got your tongue. Oh, Landy, dearie, me, Huckleberry, come here. I declare, where have you been? She licks a finger and smooths oh, Huck's hair. Get yourself in such a state. There, now that's better. Now come with me. I want you to meet a very nice little lady. And Polly fusses with Tom. I'm sorry, your land sake. What have you got? Oh, oh, Mary Jane, this is my adopted son, Huckleberry Finn. And Huckleberry, this is Miss Mary Jane Wilk. Visiting Tom's Aunt Polly from down the river. I'm that glad to know you, Master Finn. She curtsies. Goodness alive, Huckleberry, stand up straight. Are you struck dumb, boy? Mary Jane has just played a beautiful little piece for us on the piano. Why don't you show her what a fine lad you've become? Let's see how much you remember from your Sunday school lesson. Shucks, man. Oh, that'll be splendid. Tell me who Moses was. Well, he was that little critter found in them bulrushes. Bulrushes. And who found him? Hawk looks to Tom. Mary Jane mimes a head ornament. Oh, Moses was found by the king's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter. Don't you remember anything correctly? Huh? Ma'am, like this. You first begun to tell me about Moses. I was in a sweat to find out all about him. By and by, you let it out that he'd been dead a considerable long time. And I didn't care no more. I don't take no stock in dead people. Me neither. I reckon you boys don't realize that a wise man like Judge Thatcher, so to speak, learns from the past so that he can prepare for the future. Ma'am, I reckon it's the present I'm most interested in. Me too. They glance at Mary well, Jane. You boys she smiles. Go upstairs and comb your hair and wash your hands proper like. You can at least look like little gentlemen at prayer meetings. Yes, ma'am. Come on, Tom. And don't be all night about it, boys. They rush upstairs. Oh, oh, Miss Douglas. I'm so glad we can have a moment together. I'm just bursting with news and I haven't had a chance to tell you. Mary Jane received a letter this morning telling how her father was taken down with an illness. So I went right over to see Judge Thatcher, and he's going to accompany Tom and me on the riverboat when we take Mary Jane back to Morganville. My stars, Polly, this is news indeed. I have a hankering for a nice little river trip myself. Nothing like it to relax a body. Miss Douglas, would you and... Would uh, you and Master Finn care to come along too? We have plenty of extra room space at home. Well, now, I just don't know. Oh, do come along. I'm sure the judge can engage passage for you and Huck, too, and the river boat's due to dock next Monday. Well, that does just give mm -hmm. us time. Oh, I'm so glad. She spins. It'll be ever so nice with you both along. And Master Finn. She gazes toward the upstairs and lifts her shoulder. Now Huck brushes his hair in a mirror, cutting an unruly lock. Tom sits in a window seat nearby. See that whippoorwill? And I wish I was a bird and free like him. I sure enough do. It ain't worked out like we planned, has it, Huck? We're being civilized, Tom. I'll go along with it. I swear I wished I was in my old rags and sugar hogs head again. He wears a floppy bow tie. I'd even go back to living with my old man, as mean and ornery as he was. Then he hadn't gone off and got himself drowned. Huck, you're going to find out about it sooner or later. So I reckon I ought to maybe tell you myself. But your old man, he ain't drowned at all. Turned up in the village today. I feared drunk as a skunk and talking almighty big like he was the president of the United States. Honest engine? Honest engine, Huck. 
I knowed all the time he was too mean to get himself drowned in debt. Say, I'll bet he's heard about my fortune. Come back to claim it himself. You better tie up your fortune so as he can't get at it. That's all I got to say. Yeah, we're coming. Oh, I just thought you. Evening, huh? Tom? A middle-aged, mustachioed Tom, man in black. Run downstairs and escort the ladies to church, will you? I'll be along directly as soon as I have a few words here with her. Sure. See you in church, Huck. Yeah, Tom. A singing and a praying. <laughs> sit down, son. Now, I hope you ain't gonna be too upset by what I'm about to tell you. They sit on Huck's bed. And I know where it is, Judge. My old man's not drowned, is he? Oh, so you already know, huh? Well, he's making a heap of trouble about your money. Yeah, I suspicion that, too. Oh, this Judge, I wish I didn't have that money. Ain't brought me nothing but a peck of worry. I don't want to go to that old prayer meeting tonight. Places a hand on his stomach. You know, I feel too sick to go to that prayer meeting tonight. Well, I'll tell the widow, Douglas, you are indisposed. Well, don't tell her that. Just tell her I'm sick. Huh? Oh, oh, all right, Doug. He leaves. Huck looks up for a moment and then runs to the door. Judge! Judge, have they all went? Well, I'll get and make sure. Yeah, yeah, they all gone. Huck bounds down the stairs to join the judge in the parlor. Hey, Judge, I was wondering. You reckon I could give my money away, all of it? Give it away? I want you to take it, Judge. I want to make a present of it to you. Oh, is this because of what you're afraid your father might do? Oh, part ways. Then I got that constant feeling that, like they say, Money's the root of all evil? Well... Civilized ways I'm getting into, Judge, they can be powerful evil. I just want to sell out. Oh, I get the idea. You want to sell your fortune to me, not just give it to me. Is that the correct idea? Sure, if I can sell it and not get any money for it. Well, now, let me see. The judge grasps yeah, a pen and paper. Yeah, mm -hmm. I ain't never lived in a house with people before. and Kind of got that hankering and restless feeling. Just to get out and do for myself. Let the rest of the world take care of itself. Now, look at here, son. We all in this world, every man of us, and we've got to learn to live with folks and tolerate them and try to understand other people. Now, here, here, I got it all written out for you. In consideration of the sum of one silver dollar, I, Huckleberry Finn, do assign my entire fortune to Judge Thatcher to do as he sees fit. Now, here. There's your dollar. He pulls a coin from his vest pocket. Now you just sign. Sign right here. Sounds all right and proper. <laughs> he smiles and taps Huck's back. Mm -hmm. I feel like all my troubles have just melted away. Now you just go on up to bed. And don't you worry anymore, you hear me? Yes, sir. Thanks a lot. He escorts the judge to the Good front night, door. Judge. Good night, boy. Huck picks up a lit candle in a candle holder and steps upstairs. The judge looks at the document outside the home's doors, adorned with frosted glass designs. Next, Huck lights a gas lamp in his room and turns with a start. Old man drinks from a bottle. Maybe I am. Maybe I am. <laughs> Ain't you the sweet silly dandy? He sniffs at Huck's shoulder. Hmm. Well, a little tanning with some cow oil knocked that out of here. It just ain't no end to your ass since you got yourself rich. I ain't rich. You give me that money tomorrow first thing. I want it. I don't have any money. Get it from that old judge. I seen your boy come up here doing business with him, signing papers. I seen him give you a whole dollar. Well, you can sh share that out right now. Hawk hands it over. Ma, I get the rest. I can't get it. It ain't mine no more. What do you mean? That paper I signed with the judge gives it whole and entire to him. Why, you lying little cheat. 
You ain't no son of mine no more. Look, but I'm going to make you look. like it. No, 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 back talk. You come right along with me here, right now. Yeah. Oh. He grabs Hawk and pulls him toward the door. He gestures to the window. I, I'll deal with that. Yeah, judge tomorrow. He pats Huck's rear, and they both climb through the window. Next, the widow Douglas, Aunt Polly, and Mary Jane in bonnets return, along with the judge and Tom. I'll get the coffee on directly. Uh, Tom, you run up and see how Huck's faring. Yes, Aunt Polly. Now come along with you, boy. Mary Jane looks up after them and grins. Mr. Bliss, mm -hmm. I declare, I think something's brewing. You know, men always stick together, closer than sideshow freaks. You may be right at that. Mm -hmm. Maybe we ought to investigate. They walk toward the staircase. You come along too, Mary Jane. Now, in Huck's room, the judge picks up a flask, a small bottle, from Huck's bed. He shakes his head. Uh. Come back, judge. Huck's Paul come back and kidnapped him. Yeah, I'm afraid you're right, Tom. I bet that mean old man's gonna hold him for ransom. Oh! He's been kidnapped! And I only just met him! I gotta get a posse together, Judge, and go rescue him, like I swore. We're blood brothers. Tom starts out, but turns back. Hey, Judge, how do you get a posse together? Next, in a shack, Huck's father with Huck, back in overalls and a checked shirt. <laughs> yeah! Ah, you look like the son of a Like that fancy pants. They try to make it. I gotta go back to town, have it out with that uppity judge and that silly old woolly woman. <laughs> but you're gonna stay locked up right here and wait on me, hand and foot. Like a dutiful son should. You understand? Yes, sir. <laughs> you're gonna sleep right here on the floor. As for these clothes, he tosses the torn garments out a door. That's what I think of them in their ways. Green and right, huh? Spring your family no good to the The burly man collapses on a mattress. Huck settles on a patch of floor, holding his knees to his chest. Now, Huck is in a corner, digging at the floor on one side of the shack. Huck's father begins to stir. He opens his eyes and slowly pulls himself off the bed, creeping up behind Huck. Struggles with his father. Hawk's father raises his arm and all goes black. Next, Tom, back in jeans and shirt, paddles a rowboat toting a small raft. He floats up to a grassy bank, steps on shore, and secures the boat with a rope around a tree stump. Looking side to side, he cups his hands over his mouth. <whistles> Hawk looks up, stands, and whistles back. Tom rushes through overgrown grasses and discovers the shack. Oh, is that you? Huh. Can't you get out of here at all? Oh, Tom, I've tried everything, but I can't get out of here. I couldn't get out if I wanted to. Pa, he just gets worse and worse. Well, don't you worry none, Huck. Didn't you and me swear to be blood brothers? I gotta get you out of here. Listen, I towed a raft over with me. It's got provisions on it. Food, rope, my double-blade knife, my patented work prefinicator. Plenty enough to take you down as far as Morganville. 
That's where I gotta go, and I can meet you there. We can escape west and fight engines. Come on, I can't get out of here. Uh, the cars won't over here now, so I better light out. Watch out for him, because he's higher than a summer kite, and real mean besides. I'll be seeing you. Tom, hide the raft in them bulrushes where Powell won't find it. Sure, Huck. I'll be looking for you. Tom runs off. Huck resumes his position on the floor, his knees to his chest and head down. Tom hops in his boat and paddles. Huck's father carries a sack over his back. Tom spies on the scene from his boat. Mark's <laughs> paw stumbles into the shack and looks around. joins old man Finn on hands and knees at the door. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Huck slaps his hand on the key. His paw grabs Huck's hand. That's my dear old body. I'm gonna teach you some proper medicine. The grizzled man pulls Huck up by the hand, but then grabs a switch or long twig. Huck runs around the cabin. His paw follows and stumbles. Huck bounds for the door and escapes. Where are you? Help me up on here. Help me up here. Huck stands on the raft using a long pole to push himself away. The man totters on his feet, shaking a finger in the air. A Mississippi River Vista, a broad waterway against a riverbank. A title, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. The days passed and the great Mississippi just went roll, roll, rolling along as it always does. A pole swishes the water. Huck controls it by the other end on the raft and chomping an apple. Born along on its current, too, went Huck Finn, alone, free at last as the whippoorwill bird that he had so envied. Huck tosses the apple in the river. He continues to paddle, but then stands and looks toward the far bank. Two well-dressed men appear. They're soon followed by others. One wears a star and bears a rifle. Another holds a bloodhound's leash. Huck stands on his raft, gently paddling the water. Then Huck looks around and pulls back a claw. The two well-dressed men crawl out. One is tall and thin and wears a goatee, along with a cape over his suit. The other is older and short, hair thinning. You can come out now. We're in the middle of the river. The coast is clear. Ooh. You are... You are a veritable prince among men. Oh, my boy. My boy. I shall always be eternally grateful to you, my boy. Well, what's this all about? Why were they chasing you anyhow? Well, between the acts of my recitation from the works of the Bard of Avon, you've heard of the immortal Shakespeare, haven't you? William, that is. Well, during the intermission, I was settling an article that takes the tartar off the teeth, and it does take it off, too. Generally, the enamel along with it. Well, I reckon I just stayed in that miserable little town longer than I should have. What was you running from when I met up with you? Well, <clears throat> I'll tell you. 
Here's how it happened. See, I was uh, holding a little temperance survival in that bad town for about a week. <laughs> Doing mighty well, too. I was the pet of all the women folks, uh, old and young. Bless them. <laughs> yes, sir, and I was making it mighty tough for them runners. Also picking up six or seven dollars a night. Now, unfortunately, a little rumor got circulated that uh, I wasn't such a temperate man myself. That I was spending my time with a little private jug on the slide. He pulls a flask out of a pocket. The other fellow reaches for it, but it's tossed in the river. When the ruckus started, I took off a little lickety split. <laughs> yes, sir, double time. I, I didn't even wait to have breakfast with my latest garland. <laughs> oh, man. I reckon you need to team it up together. Double team it. What do you think? Hmm, well, I'm not undisposed. <laughs> what have you uh, got in your mind? Why not? I must ponder over this question. Oh. He closes his eyes, an elbow to his knee, and points an index finger on his forehead. Is that how you ponder a question? Well, uh, what are you laughing about? To think that I should live to be leading such a life, be degraded down in such company. The short man stands. <laughs> Darn your skin. Do you mean to say that the company here ain't good enough for you? Yes, it is good enough. Good as I deserve. Who fetched me so low when I was so high? I did it myself. I don't blame anybody, gentlemen. I deserve it all. Let the cruel world do its work. Take everything from me, loved ones, property, my own noble title and name. <laughs> what in tarnation are you talking about? Oh, you wouldn't believe it. The world never believes but Let that pass. She's of no matter. Secret of my book. I'll repeat it to you, gentlemen. He stands and removes his hat. By right, I am a duke. Yes, a duke. My great grandfather, eldest son of the Duke of Bridgewater, fled to this country. I'm the rightful Duke of Bridgewater. Here I am, all alone, degraded to the hospitality of a mere rat. I should be living in a castle, with all addressing me as your grace. I'll call you your grace. The only name I know you by. If you don't mind being called Grace, that's the way I'll call you. You are indeed a gentleman to the matter born. Oh, your Grace. Pooh. <laughs> now, uh, look here, Bill. Water. Let me tell you something. You ain't the only one that's been dragged down, snaked down, uh, uh, wrongfully uh, from a high position. Oh, what do you mean? Well, can I, uh, can I trust you, Bill's Water? You boy? To the death, mm. the secret of your being, speak. Gentlemen, <clears throat> I am the disappeared dolphin of France. You are the what? Yes, sir. <clears throat> your eyes right now at this very moment is a looking at the poor disappeared dolphin. I'm Louis XVII. Yes, sir. Son of Louis XVI and Queen Mary Antoinette. <laughs> Gee, well, I can see you. Yes, I am. He dabs his nose with a handkerchief. The rightful king of France. And if the whole world was in its proper place, and me along with it, you all would be calling me Your Majesty. I'll call you that, Your Majesty. Your Majesty. The Duke bows and removes his your hat. Grace. The Duke resumes his seat on a box. Now, uh, have you pondered? Have you made up your mind as what we're going to be uh, double teamed out of doing? I have indeed. Teaming me now in a very gracious flash. Hmm. About 10 miles of there, about down the river, is a little town called Morganville. Uh, Morganville. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, <clears throat> what about Morganville? Leader. Talk about this leader. Mm -hmm. Just you and me, all in due time, in the dead of night. The two each open small pocket knives or razors and glance toward Hawk. Next, nighttime. Hawk lies on his stomach on the raft, a hand dangling in the river. The Duke and the Dauphin lie on their backs, their heads almost touching. The Dauphin fans himself with his hat, then removes his shoes. How'd you, uh, how'd you happen to hear about this? Oh, I was quenching my thirst today in the local pub, and I heard all about a very wealthy man named Peter Wilkes, 
who died yesterday in Morganville. Who? Yeah? What's that got to do with you and me? Oh, plenty. Peter Wilkes was expecting the arrival of his two English brothers from Sheffield, England, mm -hmm. before his demise. The brothers were delayed. And nobody knows what the brothers Wilkes, George and Harvey, look like. Don't you see, Your Majesty? We'll impersonate the brothers Wilkes. In claim the folks and poor Peter Wilk left to his only child, Mary Jane. Hawk's eyes are open. He licks his lips. Good. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute here. What in the world are we going to use for identification? Oh, I memorized the intimate facts about the family. Because Peter Wilk didn't put any trust in banks, bless him. The money's all in gold, left in the custody of his only child, Mary Jane. Hmm. <laughs> we'll rest with this, Your Majesty. <laughs> yes. Until, uh... Dawn to break. Toward Hawk. Sleep on, innocent laddie. <laughs> sleep on. Oh, yes. Sleep the sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care. Hawk, his head resting on a hand, jostles slightly. Now the great expanse of the Mississippi River seems to glide by. Several birds fly. Gentle waves churn in the river. Next, the Dauphin, Hawk, and the Duke stand on the raft. The Dauphin waves his razor at Hawk. Remember none of your tricks, Sonny. Yeah, remember, you never saw us before. Understand? If you value your life, you better not pause in Morganville. I don't even want to stop here. Majesty, give me your umbrella there. Yes, there's my brother. The Duke dips the end of the umbrella in the water. Here. It's shallow enough here, Your Majesty. We can make it on in from here. That's fine, fine. Thank you, Mr. Brother. <laughs> the two gather their bags and step off the raft. Remember, boy, you keep on going. Yes, sir. You, you, you remember, young fellow, you just hold your tongue. If you, if you should have heard something that, that you shouldn't have. Alone, Huck pokes his raft pole in the water, propelling the raft. I gotta get to Mary Jane. I gotta warn her. The two men climb up an embankment among tall grasses and plants. There he goes off like a scared rabbit. Yeah, don't worry about him. Yeah, remember, he's uh, he's just a little boy. Uh, now all haste to Morganville. Remember, I'm Brother George. Yes, sir, and I am Brother Harvey. They clasp hands. Next, Huck guides the raft to shore and scrambles onto land. He secures the raft's tie rope to a stump. Suddenly, Hawk's father emerges from the overgrowth. He grabs Hawk. I cut you right where I was. And I'm going to put you where I can find you when the right time comes. <laughs> no, no, George. I'll learn you to teach your poor pa out of what is rightfully his. He pulls Hawk deeper into the reeds and weeds. Then, a small structure atop two levels of a wooden bridge. Hawk's paw drags Huck to a post, pulls an iron collar around Huck's neck chain, and latches it to the post. No, 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 no. I don't care. You're going to stay right here, chained up, chained up just like a runaway slave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, I'll show you to cheat your paw. <laughs> and when I need you, oh, you'll think this no good. I'm going to know just where to find you. He wraps a chain around Hawk and the post. <laughs> he pats Hawk on the head. Ah, ah, that's a good boy. You twist and squirm, and you bruise your dear little double time and neck. <laughs> the man tugs at some chains at the side of the shack. <laughs> but releases them and grabs a bottle off a barrel. He takes a long swig. I need it, Doc. Now, you think of all the good food and cool drinks you ever tasted. 
And no, you're never gonna taste them again. Let I come back for you. He stumbles out of the shack. Huck grimaces, struggling against his chains. The wide Mississippi River and the words, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. The great Mississippi flows onward towards the sea, and although a day and another night have passed, Huck presses against his restraints. It has seemed like a century to one in poor Huck's desperate plight. Huck's shirt is open. His chest is sweaty and grimy. But there is another who has awaited Huck's coming. One who hasn't forgotten the oath of everlasting brotherhood he took in blood. Tom paddles a rowboat beside Huck's raft. He ties his boat at the pole on the raft and pulls the cover off a crate on Huck's raft. Tom steps off the raft and on shore, looking to the ground. spots billowed fabric at the water's edge. He tugs at it, steps back with a grimace, and then cups his hands at his mouth. stirs and responds. Tom hurries to Huck's side. Huck! Tom! Gee, Manny, what a terrible flight. Tom, I gotta get out of here fast. I'll think of something. Tom glances around and grabs a utensil like a spade. I think I can break it open with this. Might hurt. But can you grin and bear it? Huck nods. Can you go ahead? I'll keep grinning. Huck grins broadly as Tom strikes at the post. Next, Mary Jane dabs at her eyes, seated with the Dauphin and the Duke. The widow and Aunt Polly are seated nearby. Uncle George, Uncle Harvey, if only ride was, was Papa was still alive. There, there, my child. We suffered a series of calamitous misfortunes en route. Yes, my dear, but it's all right now. We are here to take care of you always. Ah, oh, yes. And after the funeral, we'll take you back to our country estate in England. Wouldn't you like to ride about the countryside and have all the kindly villagers address you as little lady bountiful? Thank you. Here, Uncle. Outside, Tom and Hawk at a window. Tom, you've got to do something. They ain't a real uncle, like I told you. Yeah, but she believes them. You've got to prove they ain't real. No. <laughs> what a blessed little angel you are, my dear. Oh, don't cry. <laughs> Just a minute, Mary Jane. The judge. Have you gentlemen any proof at all of your identity? Well, do we need proof other than our loving hearts? Why, Judge Thatcher, don't you believe them? There's something very curious about these two men, Miss Douglas. Mary Jane, I ask you not to accept them till I can investigate and authenticate their true identities. Oh, to be doubted. To be doubted in a strange land, in my own dear departed brother's home. Oh, the cruelty of fight. The Duke steps away, then now glances you back. Here. You look here, Your Honor. I want you to know that we are only here for our dear brother's... Uh, we want to be present at my dear brother's funeral orgies. There. Doesn't that prove their charlatans? Huh? I'll warrant you they're not even English. Well, this man doesn't even know the difference between obsequies and orgies. Sir. In Sheffield, we call them orgies. You call us charlatans, and so you are, sir. <laughs> Mary Jane, I warn you, as your father's old friend, to have nothing further to do with these ignorant adventurers. Put them out of the house right now, honey. Will you? Please. Mary Jane steps to a table drawer, opens it, and removes a pouch. Here's my answer. Uncle George, this is the fortune that... My father left me. Will you take care of it for me until I reach Sheffield with you? Gladly, my child, gladly. Blessings on the honesty of an innocent woman. 
No. I think you did right, dear. A woman can only trust her intuition. Ah, double blessings on the trust of the the, the trust of the female heart. Oh. And no, my dear uncle, you must be very weary with your travels. If you'll come with me, I'll show you to your room. With pleasure, my dear niece, with pleasure. Thank you, Angel. Thank you. The judge raises and lowers a hand. Aunt Polly shakes her head. Oh. She did do it proper, Ron. Poor little thing. Hey, look, huh? We can climb up the roof here. The guest room window's up there, and we can see where them thieves hide out the fortune. They clamber onto a low, gabled roof. You just nap as long as you like. I'll call you for dinner at noon. Thank you. Thank you, darling. Thank you, my dear child. We are indeed overly tired. If you didn't just about let the cat out of the bag, you ignoramus orgy. Almighty heaven, don't you know what a real orgy is, you half-baked Roman? Oh, stop, 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 you gabbering and jabbering. Everything's well. Now, uh, where do you think we ought to, uh, Hide that fortune. Well, yes, yes, let me see. Uh, you have to give us pause here for nightfall before we can make a break for it. Aha! I have it. He points to the bed, pulls out his pocket knife, and pulls back the bed covers. Good idea. The Duke slices into the mattress along its side, inserts the pouch, and replaces the bed covers. <laughs> now for a much needed nap. <laughs> As we say in my country, a siesta. <laughs> They lie face up on the bed, side by side. Next, Tom and Huck appear at the guest room window and crawl inside past lace curtains. They kneel at the bedside and Huck removes the pouch. In line, they crawl around the end of the bed toward the door. Suddenly, the Duke confronts them. So you came back, did you, Junior? Yeah? You had your warning, didn't you? Now give me that gold. No, I won't. Take yeah. yours. Where's this? Well, I lost my... Now do it, you old here. fool. It hadn't been for me, we'd been robbed for sure. Now you give me what ain't yours, or there'd be a couple of slick throats here. No, I won't. The gold ain't yours either. It's hers. Give it me. The Duke brandishes his knife. The Dauphin grabs Tom, and the Duke comes closer to Huck. Aha! There's a knocking at the door. Come here, you young man. Tell you. Ah, ladies, we have thieves amongst us. Huh? Why, as we slept, these two posters would have made off with your gold, dear Mary Jane. I'm so young, I don't believe it. Huckleberry Finn, well, it shows bad blood will tell. Hey, man, ain't like he says, it ain't like that at all. How can you speak so of my dear uncle? Mary Jane, they're not your uncles. You've got to believe me. Why, Know all about them. Ladies, we never seen these two boys before in all our lives. Well, it crossed my heart and hope to die. Call the judge. You don't believe they're real, neither. Oh, Mrs. Douglas, let's not do anything rash. The judge does have his doubts. He's off now, having words with the local constables. Oh. Let's wait for his return. The Dauphin covers his mouth. Uh, uh, yes, madam, I do insist that I and my brother ourselves convey these two thieves to the constabulary, that the truth may out, which it will. A very good idea. Both Thomas and Huckleberry should be taught a good lesson. Take them to the constabulary. Thank you, madam. The Duke nods, and the Dauphin pulls Tom to the door. The Duke yes, follows no, with Huck. Take us down to the well, but is there some noise and ornery, but this time... He needs to be taught a good lesson. I don't know. I think we ought to wait for the judge. Mary Jane rushes from the room. The two ladies follow. I got a good hold of you there, boy. None of your monkey business. No tricks. Don't try it on me, you young fool. Don't hurt them. Please, don't. Mary Jane, make them give you back your gold. If he gets out of here, you'll never see it them or us again. Hey, hey, to the constabulary. Open wide the door, brother. The judge stands outside with two there men. There they are, the robe. Put them in handcuffs. Clark oh. and Tom slip away. In new indignity. It mm. means your crimes are finally caught up with you. Why, you two men are known in every village in Hamlet along the river. 
There's a list of charges against you a yard long. Mary Jane, these are not your uncle, just as I suspected. Your real uncle will be here by night, Paul. These men are absolute fakers. Get the gold. The Duke's got our gold on him. The Duke. Hawk goes to the Duke and pulls the pouch from his inside coat pocket. There. What did I tell you? I said we ought to wait for the judge. Oh, he's such a wise man. Take him down to the jailhouse and lock him up. They have plenty of sins to meditate upon. Oh, I like a day. The quality of mercy is not strained. You better than I hope that new jailhouse has soft beds and good victuals. Hawk hands the pouch to Mary Jane. Here you are, Miss Wilkes. Thank you. Oh, dear boy. She kisses Hawk on the cheek. I do believe you're my own true guardian angel. Hawk runs out the door. Hey, Hawk, don't go running off somewhere. Remember our own. I'll never forget it, Tom, but I gotta get out of here. Judge, go after him. Stop him. If he gets away, he's gonna go out west and fight engines. And if he goes, I'm going too. You come along with me. Mary Jane and the ladies look after them. Next, Huck unties his raft and steps onto it. Tom and the judge appear. I'm returning your fortune. You're a rich man again, son. Yes, thank you, Judge. I'll call find out about it and be after me again. No, Hop, this morning. Well, I didn't want you to go on your raft. Because there was a dead body floating out there. Your pa really got itself grounded dead this time. Hawk pauses, but then pushes off. Your pa. No, I want to be left alone. Oh, listen, Huck, you can come live with me if you want to. You be your own boss. Nobody to make you scared. You'll be a free man, son. No, I got a head wet. Well, I just want to tell you, we expect you home about 6 o'clock with a nice string of catfish for supper. And, Huck, let me remind you, catch a nice big fat one for Mary Jean. Yeah, she asked you special. They wave. Huck stands on the raft, beaming and waving. He waves, pulls up his raft pole, and picks up a thin fishing pole. He sits on the raft, leaning back against two covered crates. Huck unties the line wrapped around the pole and dangles it in the water, along with his bare feet. Against the image of Huck on his raft fishing, credits scroll. Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, based on the novel by Samuel L. Clemens. Thomas Mitchell as Old Man Finn. Elizabeth Patterson as Aunt Polly. John Carradine as the Duke. Walter Catlett as the Dauphin. Charles Taylor as Huckleberry Finn. Minor Watson as Judge Thatcher. Bobby Hyatt as Tom Sawyer. Denise Alexander as Mary Jane Wilkes. Catherine Warren as Widow Douglas. Saul Gorse as Injun Joe. Funding to purchase and make this educational program accessible was provided by the U.S. Department of Education. Contact the Department of Education by telephone at 1-800-USA-LEARN or online at www.ed.gov. The described and captioned media program provides services designed to benefit students who are blind, visually impaired, deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf-blind. These services include a library of free loan described and captioned educational media, a clearinghouse of information related to educational media access, a gateway to internet resources related to accessibility, and a center for training and evaluation of any service provider desiring to appear on the DCMP's approved lists of description and captioning service providers. There are no user registration or service fees. Visit the DCMP at dcmp.org. The DCMP is funded by the U.S. Department of Education and administered by the National Association of the Deaf.